Welcome to Tips for Teaching Online with Blackboard. We will be spending the next 55 minutes or so together talking about this. My name is Tracy Miller and I'm the Online Teaching Coordinator in the Faculty Development Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. Here's what I have for the agenda today. Um, here are how um, I've kind of framed these tips for teaching online with Blackboard. Um, it's definitely going to help you boost your efficiency and productivity. Um, I think that's an important as aspect to um, the real benefits of using Blackboard. Um, next, how you can support your students. Um, that's, of course, uh, very important. Um, we want to know how Blackboard can really help us support our students in a variety of ways. And then uh, towards the end, I'm also going to give you some tips on how to improve any synchronous sessions you might be doing in your online course. So synchronous session could be similar to um, the workshop that we're having this afternoon. So hopefully I remember to um, model a lot of the behaviors that we're going to talk about. And one of them is to make sure I keep on track with the text chat area. So it looks like everyone is sitting back and comfortable and ready to learn a little bit more about how you can boost your efficiency and productivity in your online course. So the first one is actually a new process that um, was sort of tested out this semester. It didn't start at the beginning of the semester, so I think the big rollout will be this summer and, and definitely this fall. Uh, there's a new course request process, very similar to what we've already been doing where um, you go to um, faculty services on Blackboard and you request your course for the following semester. The new part of it this time is that you will have this opportunity to make your courses auto available. And so if you remember the process before, um, when you would request your course, it would be by default unavailable to your students. And there's a lot of advantages to that because you might be building out the course. Um, you might be still waiting for enrollments to come in. Um, but in this new feature, the default will be that the courses will be made available and they'll be available on the date that the course begins, so the beginning of the semester. There's no sort of need to go in there after the fact and make your courses available. Um, but there, you know, there, like I said, there was some advantages to not having it made available. So if you want to um, kind of take that away, then just unselect the auto availability. And that'll kind of bring you back to the old process where you will make the course available when you are ready. Um, the other thing is, is maybe you want to change the availability date. You really like the idea that there's this auto availability, um, but you really like to open up the course maybe a week early for the students to get comfortable, um, have them start introducing themselves, in which case you can just go ahead and change that availability date to whatever sort of makes sense to you. And then um, the end of the process again is just submitting it and um, the course process will go through and you'll find your courses available on Blackboard, um, usually within 24 hours, um, but they're happening much quicker at this point too. Um, again, we're, we're gonna go through sort of a big test this summer when everyone's going through this process um, but they're talking about it actually being immediately available to you. So some great advantages um, with this new process. Uh, the next tip I'd like to suggest um, in helping your efficiency in your pro productivity is to really think about how you're going to structure your course and, um, and how you're going to add your assessments and your content together. And that's sort of my first tip, is that um, build out your structure, um, however that may be. In this example here, um, I have one of my courses, and I built out things in modules. And 
I've added the assessments within each of those modules. So when the students are going through their activities, um, the assessment is right there built into the module. And um, I think that's really helpful and it keeps the, the students productive. Um, some of the other things I do though is I may add um, other content within the modules, but then in this case, in my left-hand navigation, I also have readings and resources. And what's in readings and resources are course links to the readings and resources that are found within those modules. And so basically, I don't have two versions. I don't have two instances of the readings and resources. I just have one that's a link and um, one that is actual access. So I'm just giving the students multiple ways to be able to, to access the readings and resources. You could also do that with assessments. Um, it just, again, gives the students two places to kind of um, find them. But from your perspective, you only have to um, maybe update them in one place, which will really increase your efficiency. Um, the next idea is really um, useful when you are originally designing or developing a course, and that's to build out a weekly structure in sort of that module one, that week one environment. Once you get the structure the way you like it, then you can go ahead and copy it um, and make more and more um, modules, units, um, topics, whatever your um, kind of building out in your course. So in this case, um, I've created this welcome because I know each module is going to have a welcome of some sort. And I've just named it um, X. That kind of reminds me to, that I need to change them um, after I get them all copied over. Um, just some placeholder information to remind myself of um, the structure that I've developed in the template. Um, each unit will have an overview. I've given myself sort of the sentence starter, so each of those um, units will be um, consistent. And this is the template's really good for that consistency because then I know that um, for the students, they're going to be looking at a consistent structure. But when I'm designing and developing, I don't have to go back and forth and try to remember um, that that design that I put together. On the next one, I know I want to put the objectives for each of the units up front. And I also want to make sure that it comes from a, a student perspective. So it feels like the students are um, they're understanding that this is something that they will be able to do. And so again, I just started off with a, a little sentence starter there. And anything else that you have, again, you're going to build out that first um, kind of unit, and then you're just going to do a copy in order to um, build out the rest. Save some time rather than um, kind of individually building out each unit and then realizing that um, they're all kind of wonky and inconsistent. So that's a good tip, um, especially for your productivity. The next tip is um, to use your student preview mode. And that's this icon at the top. And it, um, it looks like an eyeball to me. It also kind of looks like a refresh screen to me. Um, but what it does is it gives you that student view. And I think when you're putting things together, if you use the student view, um, you're going to see maybe um, things that you thought were available that are actually hidden, um, or maybe the how the instructions kind of um, appear as maybe students are taking a quiz or submitting an assignment. It gives you a really good perspective um, in order for you to be able to answer even questions for students because maybe they're emailing and saying they can't see something. Uh, the student preview mode is a really valuable that way. The other thing that um, can be unknown if you haven't tried this before, but when you exit out of the student preview mode, you have the option of um, saving all the data that you've kind of 
created as you've been kind of playing around in student preview mode. Let's say you, you took one of the tests to see how it went. Um, or you have the option of deleting or keeping the data. And so deleting it gives you like a nice fresh start. Keeping it will actually create a new user in the course and it'll be your name, um, underscore, and then um, preview user. And so you can kind of see um, maybe, you know, how what happens when you submit assignment and, and what it looks like from the per student's perspective. And then you can go ahead and like grade your assignment and get an idea if you haven't used um, some of the grading tools like inline grading yet. It, again, gives you that um, time to practice a little bit before the students are actually um, seeing some of these things. So I definitely recommend uh, student preview mode. And you can use that as many times as you want. So if you want to sort of go in and out of there, um, then go ahead and do that. Uh, if you are using any of the statistics, um, the median grade for an assignment, for instance, it is going to count that student preview mode. So you're probably going to want to um, delete that data before you um, you know, kind of use those course statistics. So just a, a tip if you are using student preview mode and keeping the data. Uh, the next one um, is if you are using a discussion board, um, and this is a grading quickly tip, make sure you enable grading on the discussion boards. Sometimes discussion boards are not used for grading. Um, if you're going to have a question and answer forum or um, some kind of social lounge or something. You're not going to grade it. But if you are grading that discussion board, make sure you enable the grading. Um, and it's a checkbox when you're setting up the discussion board. And so some of the um, advantages of that is that um, you're going to get a nice table like this um, to grade your discussions. And you'll see that grade discussions at the, the top of the board for you. Um, and it's going to let you know everybody that participated in the discussion. It's also going to show you how many posts they created. Um, so especially if you're asking the students and you're grading them on um, multiple posts, then you're going to know that they've um, created the proper amount of posts or even more. Um, and you can go into this grading workflow and kind of just simply go through and you're going to see all of their posts in one spot. So you're not kind of hunting around for, let's say, Louisa, um, you know, we know she did an initial post, but where else did she post? Who did you repost to? You're going to see all this when you've enabled that grading feature. So really makes grading much quicker, much easier. Um, if you just click that one button to enable grading on the discussion board. Another great way to really have you more efficient in your grading, um, especially if you've got a lot of grading to do, especially if you have a lot of grading to do at the end of the semester, like we all may be feeling that right now, um, using the Blackboard Interactive Rubrics really helps out with that. This screen I have in front of you here has um, what the interactive rubric can look like when you pop it open when you're grading. And you can see there's a lot of detail here. Um, the, the interactive rubrics do take a bit of work up front, um, but the great thing is, is that they make that grading so much easier and you can copy and paste them into new courses, um, and you can use, also use them numerous times. Um, so they're well worth the work that you do initially, because again, they're gonna make this grading so much easier um, when it comes time to use them. So really, here's the grading um, workflow here. Um, you're gonna look at the, the work that the student's done. You're gonna pop open this interactive rubric, it's going to remind you of all the different um, criteria and what was inside of the criteria. How did you identify what an expert um, program description was, for instance, in this example we have here. 
and it's just a click of this box and it just starts adding up the grades for you. So really convenient. Also the feedback area um, gives you the opportunity to put feedback in um, right where you need it. So you can be really specific but really quickly on what the students have done really well, like in the instance of this expert feedback. Or honestly, I like to add more specific feedback when the students are struggling with something. So I'm going to let them know, um, in this case, description does not demonstrate understanding of program, does not contain details of the program. I can give them specific instances on um, how I think that they can improve their work or maybe how they missed the mark here. So interactive rubrics, really great tool um, to increase your productivity and grading. Um, my next tip for grading quickly is to use your Smart Views feature. And uh, there are some automatic Smart Views in your Blackboard course. And if you pop open your Grade Center, um, you'll see that there, the default ones are sort of these um, assignment categories, assignments, discussions, um, or you can create your own. And so and maybe, again, you're kind of down to the, the end of the semester here, and you really want to zero in on grading the, the final project here. You can just create a smart view to in the Grade Center. Um, and that is, it almost works as a filter. And so the, you will only be looking at the assignments that have been submitted for, again, that final project. Um, I think about it right now, I'm grading um, some discussions, but I'm also grading some um, final work. And so um, I, I like to take a little bit more time when I grade something that um, is going to have a lot of feedback. So I might use that smart view to filter down um, that final project area. Um, you can find the smart views in the Grade Center. So if you opened up the full Grade Center and then you went to Manage, which would be at the top, Smart View is one of your options. And it's really easy to kind of just create and name your Smart Views. Um, you could also use Smart Views to um, maybe make Smart Views for different groups. And um, then you're going to grade like group work um, using that filter. So love smart views for that. Um, check it out. Try one maybe next semester um, just to get a feel for it. It's not anything that the, the students see. Um, it's purely for your grading workflow. So another tip that I have for grading is to use the grade submission tool that we have here at NIU. Um, it makes that end of semester work a lot easier. Um, it's easily found in um, your Blackboard course. And let me tell you about what it does. What it does is it takes all the grades that you've done in Blackboard. If you've been using the, the Grade Center and doing all your grading in Blackboard, and now it's time to um, kind of add them back into my NIU. This tool just makes it really simple to use. And so just we, we usually do at the end of the semester sort of a um, things to consider at the end of your, you know, the, the season here. And this can walk you through all the steps. But you're going to just make sure that they're uh, the total column that you want to be um, added to my NIU is identified as the external grade, and I can tell that this one has here because it's got the green check mark next to it. And then you're also going to want to make sure that there's at least a letter grade in there. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you've selected um, letter as the um, one of the displays. Um, and then we use a grade submission tool. Um, it's basically going to just port all of those letter grades over to my NIU. You'll get an opportunity to kind of verify it. 
um, and make sure everything is the way you look at it before you actually hit that final button to submit it to my NIU. But that way you're not in my NIU um, selecting all the drop downs and adding uh, the grades into my NIU um, after you spent all that time using Blackboard. Yeah, the, the grade submission tool is a great option for that. But I do want to pause for just a minute um, to see if anyone has any questions on what we just talked about um, before we kind of transition to um, supporting your students. How do I enter a letter grade into the total column? Good question. So the, in the total column, um, if you're, you're using all of the different, uh, if you're using graded discussions, if there's already um, total points um, for you know, an assignment or a test or any of that, the total column is going to be adding them up. So it's just a matter of changing it to um, the letter grade. And so what you do, um, and this is kind of a um, stagnant screen here, but at the top, there's a drop down menu. And that will ask you a, a bunch of things. One of it will be edit um, column information. And when you edit the column information, um, right below the description, it'll say um, primary display and secondary display. So um, there's a drop down and uh, there's points, there's percentage, there's also um, letter grade. And so that is how you would um, make sure it was a letter grade. Yeah, okay. I wanted to make sure that I addressed like the you know, you could you could manually enter it in, but really you're using the, the grade center and then you're just changing it into a letter grade. We will talk a little in a little bit too about another option you can use um, in the grade center. And that will be coming up. So it's not coming up soon enough for me. <laughs> but I'll I'll show you another way that you're going to use that exact thing where you're going to edit the column information and change the primary display. But let's start by talking about how we can help our students in our online course. If you recall, if you use Blackboard before, even um, at a minimum level for your face-to-face -face course, you probably remember that the default opening page for students is the course module page. And so there's different elements in there where um, they can see what they have to do. They might see due dates. They might see the last few announcements. But I think when you're in an online course and students are just starting, what we're recommending is that there's a getting started area and that you make that your course entry point. And in this case, in this example, it says welcome start here. So the students can always go back to that, but it's really nice when they open up the, the course for the first few times and they can see this welcome here. Um, in this case, um, there's a little bit of a course description that could be the course description that's in the catalog. Um, it could have more of a welcoming message, maybe a personal greeting from you. Um, also, some key information they might need to know up front. In this case, there's um, some meeting dates over here. That would be if you had any um, required live meetings, whether they be face-to-face um, -face or online, just kind of letting them put that on the calendar. Um, any other kind of information that you think um, would really help the students to be successful when they first start the course. But again, the important part here, the tip, is to make that the course entry point. And you can do that by changing the um, area in customization of the left-hand navigation at, under teaching style. And one of the options under there is um, to change the course entry point. And so again, you're going to change it from that module page um, to in this case, it's the content area that we just named um, Welcome Start here. 
After a couple weeks, you can go ahead and change that back or maybe change it to announcements, which would be my other recommendation. Okay, another way you can help your students use your course is to remember to add due dates. So um, there's due date options all over the place. And the advantage of adding these due dates is um, the students can find them um, when they click on an assignment. Um, they know right up front, sort of in the instructions, when the due date is. It can help you because if the students do submit the work late, um, having the due date in there will prompt a trigger so you can tell right off the bat that the students turned in the work late. Um, also, it'll add any of these items to the course calendar. And so students can look at sort of the broader scope of things and see when different due dates are occurring so that they can plan out their, uh, their week maybe or maybe even their month. So definitely adding due dates to assignments have some real advantages for you and your students. Um, when you are adding those folders or those um, modules, units, whatever you want to call them to your course, we talked about at the beginning creating that template and then creating um, copies of that template. One of the things I'm going to suggest here is that you actually post the folders in reverse order. So that means that the oldest unit is going to be down at the bottom of the screen and then you can use your availability dates to have folders and units open up as the weeks are starting. So in other words, in that very first week, they're only going to see unit one at the bottom of the screen. They're only going to see unit one on the screen. But then as new units open up, they're going to open up on top of those older units. And that's so the students and you don't have to do a lot of scrolling. They're going to see, sort of see the most current and the most important information at the time up on top. So again, newest always at top is a great um, thing to do in your course. And if you haven't done that already and you have something built out, just use the drag and drop and sort of move things around. Um, again, can really help. Good tip there. Um, another suggestion that I have really helps at risk students. And it's called the Retention Center. And you can find the Retention Center um, in the left-hand navigation in the course management area under evaluation. And that's something that Blackboard is already doing that you may not be aware of. And I'm actually going to throw that out as a question right now. How many of you realize that there was a Retention Center in your Blackboard courses? Maybe if you're, even if you're students, it might be. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, so we've got a, at least one note. So I, I, I accomplished that. <laughs> um, so Beatrice, let me tell you a little bit about it. It's um, monitoring your students for some what's considered at-risk behaviors. And those are missed deadlines. Um, grades learned, the default is 25% uh, below the class average. Um, activity alert is um, kind of a combination of um, a few things that the students are doing in the course. How, how active are they in the course? And then an access alert um, in case the students are not uh, getting in the course as often as you would like. So because we are coming up on a summer session, um, and many of you have used um, or at least seen the Retention Center before, um, consider how quickly summer courses can go. If you are normally um, teaching a 16-week course and it's suddenly a eight-week course, you may want to look at the access alerts um, because students are um, really doubling down on their content and they should be accessing the course more frequently. 
So um, you may want to um, review that retention center and possibly change that um, Ask Us Alert to be a little bit quicker um, for the summer. Um, but again, this is a really great way, yeah, great way to kind of monitor your students. You can also notify your students through the retention center, um, and that's going to keep track of the notifications that that you do for your students and you can go back and kind of review that if you see um, a real trend that's sort of making you nervous. Uh, so this is going back to what I was talking about at the end of the last segment and that's um, creating grade center columns um, that can be to your advantage. In, this, in the first case, we were changing that total column to a letter grade. In this case, we're going to create a new grade center column but we're going to use it to start to build community with our student. And this is going to be a column that we're going to create. And instead of making it a, uh, a percentage or a letter grade, we're going to make sure we change the primary display to text because text will actually um, allow you to enter sort of whatever you want in that grade center column. In this case, I am adding the student's preferred name or their nickname, what they prefer to be called in the course. And that's so they um, feel like I've taken the time to learn, learn a little bit more about them and I can address them maybe in an email or in a discussion forum or even um, in, in any of the feedback that I give them, that I'm addressing them in a way that um, seems more personal. Um, feels like, you know, I'm um, um, understanding them a little bit more. And so in this case, our, our list of students here, um, Louisa would prefer to be called Lou. And I might have learned that through a getting to know you um, exercise icebreaker at the beginning of the course, or I, I might have noticed it um, just the way that they're addressing things. And so I want to make sure that I um, have done that so that I can, again, continue to address them the way that they would prefer. Um, I've also done this similar exercise. I've added the student's major. I teach a um, general education course, um, so there's sort of students from all over the place, and I like to kind of make note um, when I find out what their major is so I can kind of tailor my responses depending on what, what that is. Um, so I just basically clicked on create column at the top here and just created a regular column. But I also hide it from the students, which is what this slash um, is here. I just kind of want to make it my own little secret that, that I've uh, sort of created this cheat sheet so I remember their names, their nicknames, their preferred names. Um, the next sort of building community tip that I have is to create your Blackboard profile and maybe even have their students create the Blackboard profiles. Um, you can do that by clicking at the, on your um, silhouette at the top of Blackboard, um, top middle section um, that will bring you to your global navigation area and you can look for um, creating your Blackboard profile. Um, and it's a, it is a global ap application, so um, this is something that you can use across courses once it's created, and the students can use it across courses too. Um, you can set up, um, you know, add a photograph, um, set up these tiles with some different information. It is meant for the student to be able to share maybe some of their skills. Um, my students always share how far along they are in their program, which gives me a lot of information. Um, as far as, you know, are they stressed out because they're going to graduate next month? Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting perspective to be able to see that. I have also added some links to my social media profiles. All of this are options. You may or may not choose to do that with your students. Um, but one of the real advantages of using the Blackboard profiles is that when the students are in the discussion boards, you will actually be able to see their um, whatever profile picture they decided to use. And so it kind of puts a face um, into the discussion board. Um, I say a face, but in some cases, um, the students will add pictures of their dogs or their, 
their favorite scene or something, which is fine too, because that's still giving you a little bit information about them. Um, you know, maybe you can ask them what the name of their dog is. Another tool for um, this, this is really supporting your students, um, but it's also going to help you with your productivity. This is going to help you manage the amount of email you get from your students. And I hear this a lot from faculty instructors that, you know, they're just being bombarded with emails and how can they sort of manage that. So creating a question and answer or help forum for your students and always pointing them in that direction can really help you reduce the amount of emails you get um, in a variety of ways. So if you encourage your students to use sort of this discussion forum instead of an email, uh, they may answer each other's questions. Uh, they may answer them you know, more quickly than you would have. Um, but they're also going to all benefit from the answer. And so, um, you know, maybe that student that uh, once they see the question, they're like, oh, I was sort of wondering that too. Um, they're going to benefit from seeing those answers. Um, and hopefully you're not going to get as many of those questions in your email. So to go along with that, um, there's this option on all the discussion boards. Um, for subscribing. And you might have wondered what it meant to subscribe to a discussion forum. And what that means is that you're going to get an email when anybody posts anything to that um, discussion board. So you're thinking, well, I thought we were trying to sort of reduce the amount of emails we get. Um, but I think in the, in the question and answer one, what it does is it's going to send you an email that somebody added something, but you don't have to necessarily stop what you're doing. You can just kind of make a mental note that, hey, I, I need to make sure I check in with that um, discussion board and kind of see what's going on. Um, again, it kind of gives you that, that pause, but you don't necessarily have to respond to it right away. Students may want to subscribe to discussion boards. Um, for instance, if they've created a thread and they want to know when other students have uh, responded to their particular thread, it's a real advantage for them to subscribe to that discussion board. Uh, maybe they're, they're hoping to get um, some feedback and, and then they're going to know right away um, when somebody has responded. So consider the subscribe button and that can um, just be another thing that will give you an indicator that there's some action going on in the course. Uh, again, maybe even again, we're talking about the summer when things are happening really quickly. It may be important that you see that there's been sort of a flourish of activity um, in the discussion. Sorry, took a drink of water there so I didn't cough in everybody's ears. So um, here is another tip when um, creating um, especially quizzes or tests in Blackboard, and that is to um, use, not use, actually, <laughs> sorry, not use the force completion button. And that's one of the options that you've probably seen when um, you've had a student take a quiz. And in theory, it sounds really great, right? That um, they're, they're going to have to sit down and take this quiz in one sitting. And um, if they don't, you know, if they try to get out of the instance and go maybe look up an answer or something like that, um, that's going to prevent them from doing that. However, what we found is if there's any sort of interruption, um, a, a internet, interruption, um, Blackboard going through some maintenance or something like that, it kicks them out of um, the instance and they're not able to get back in. And so then they're emailing you because they're freaking out that, that this happened to them. The alternative that really um, still has the same advantage for you is to use the timer. So set the timer for what you think is um, you know, a reasonable amount of time to take the quiz 
And then what happens is that if the students do try to get out of the quiz, let's say, to look up an answer, that timer continues to tick down um, while they're sort of outside of this environment. And so there's no real advantage because they're, they're, they're running out of time. But if they go back in there um, because of a glitch, um, an in internet disruption or something like that, um, they will be able to get back into the, the quiz. So again, if it's that, that temporary, um, the wireless went down or something like that, they can get right back in there and continue on with their quiz. Um, the other option is to actually turn the auto submit on. And so what that will do is that will save their responses and will submit the quiz at the end of the timer automatically and to let them know that the time's expired and that their, their answers will now be submitted. Um, if you did turn it off, what would happen is that the students will be notified that the timer is off and um, they could continue to take it. So that would be up to you. You would know how much longer, let's say they took another minute um, to kind of finish it off, that might be okay for you because that might be just that one last check. They're just going to go back and check a couple answers or maybe they're just going to like just start randomly clicking answers just hoping that um, just like if they were face to face and they just started filling out their bubbles on their Scantron, um, hoping that the testing gods were looking upon them and they got some of those answers right. So again, avoid using the forced completion. It's, it'll save you some headaches. Instead, use the timer and then, you know, turn that auto submit on and that will submit their test at the end of the timer. Okay, so I'm going to take another breath again um, to see if you have any questions on some of the suggestions I had for supporting your students. And next, we're going to move on to improving your synchronous sessions. Again, anytime you want to just add to the text chat area. OK, I missed where to create the profile. OK, so the profile is actually at the top of the screen. And I'm trying to see if any of the ones, any of the screenshots I took um, kind of show that. I think I probably cut them off. But if you were in um, any of the Blackboard pages, at the very top of the page, there's, I'd say, top, middle, but a little bit to the right-hand side, there is a um, silhouette picture your name and there's also a um, a logout area if you click on your face or, or the silhouette um, you'll see a bunch of different options um, that'll jump down at you let me make sure i get the right one for what i'm looking for Yeah, if you actually click on your face again, it'll pop open your Blackboard pro portfolio page and let you start building that out. So give it a try and shoot me an email if you have any, need any more detail. Okay, improving your synchronous sessions. Uh, the first one is um, to keep your slides simple. Um, in this case, we're going to talk, because we're talking about um, Blackboard, we're going to talk about Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is what we're in right now as a web conferencing service. Um, and one of the things, you can build out your presentations in PowerPoint and then upload them into Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Um, but you're not going to have the animations or some other things that you may be used to in, um, in PowerPoint. So just keep things simple because of that, but also just so that you um, have a nice clean look and that you're not kind of overloading your students with, with too much information 
um, when you're doing these presentations using a, a synchronous environment like Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Uh, my second sort of tip for synchronous sessions is to test your equipment early and often. Hey, we're outside of Chicago. We know what early and often means. Um, go ahead, get in there early, um, have a practice session beforehand, and test that equipment out. Make sure your, um, your speakers are working, your microphone's working, um, if you're using your camera, all of that. Test that ahead of time. It'll really reduce your stress. Um, if you're kind of jumping in there about five minutes before and something's going wrong, um, getting in there early, um, even if, you know, I do webinars like this twice a month and I still um, test it out every time um, in order to avoid any of those glitches. Um, give your students a chance to test their equipment also. Um, especially if you feel like they're going to be um, doing some presenting or something like that. Um, either do a, a practice session ahead of time um, or at least open up the session or the room uh, 15 minutes early, 30 minutes early, uh, just to give them a chance to kind of play around with the, the technology a little bit. Um, some other preparation when you're um, getting ready for one of these synchronous sessions is to think about um, the environment around you. So sometimes I don't t turn on my webcam when I do these because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody's more focused on, on the screen than and watching my talking head. But um, sometimes it, it helps to kind of have a face um, behind the voice. Um, but I want to make sure that um, what's happening around me is um, at least free of clutter and somewhat attractive, so it's not distracting um, to, to what I'm doing. Um, I've definitely been in sessions um, like this where the presenter, you know, has laundry piled up in the back rabbit and stuff. You want, you want to think about that a little bit. Um, also, avoid any strong lights behind you um, that can kind of make you um, your face and what you want them to kind of be looking at to be kind of um, darkened out. So in this case, I've always shut my blinds behind me. I want to make sure that I'm well lit, but I don't, if it's sunny out, I don't want that glare sort of behind me. Um, try to wear um, dark or muted colors. So I've got this gray sweater on to kind of uh, make sure that the, the camera doesn't start to go a little crazy. I do have, I don't know if you could tell the difference, I have sort of a, a flowery shirt on underneath. And sometimes uh, that can come across as very blurry or disjointed. Um, so try to wear, again, those dark muted colors, simple or solid patterns uh, are my tip for you. And then send a reminder. Um, we say send a reminder to your students um, just before the session um, that you'll have um, higher attendance that way. We always send out our reminders to our workshops a couple days before, and then we try to send them out the morning of, too, uh, just to kind of remind everybody what's on their calendar and uh, get folks in there. Um, in the session, um, greet students as they enter. That's what you would do in a face-to-face um, -face course, hopefully. You wouldn't like turn your back as people came into the room. You'd at least give them a greeting. Um, you can also engage in some ch casual chit-chat. Um, or in our case, we um, started a little chit-chat in the text chat area. Um, just kind of keeps things friendly. Remember to smile when you present. Um, sometimes I will put um, up on my webcam a little smiley face or googly eyes or something um, because it, it will kind of force me to smile. Even if you're not using your webcam, your voice sounds different when you're smiling. And so um, it definitely, you, you seem more approachable and, and friendly. So remember to smile. And then another tip is if you have the opportunity to assign students or TAs to monitor the text chat area um, while you are presenting in course. And that's because um, 
it can be distracting, you know, if you're in the, the middle of your lecture to have um, text come up, if, especially if you're not used to it um, and you might miss some questions that come through. So again, have, having a TA do that or even assigning different students each time uh, to be sort of the text chat monitor. Um, they can alert you when questions come up or even um, sort of gather questions for you and when you have those natural breaks, um, you can have um, those sort of synthesized student, uh, questions um, that your monitor has gathered for you. Okay, so my next bunch of tips just didn't quite fit into a category, so I called them oddball tips. And so the first one is to hide old courses in the My Courses module on Blackboard. And you can do that by clicking on the gear box that's in the corner of the, your My Courses module. Um, that gear box doesn't show up until you sort of hover over it. So if you haven't checked it out before, go ahead and do that. And you can basically uh, make courses visible or not. You're not going to make them go away. They're just not going to appear in that My Courses area. Or you can also group them by term. So that's another good way to just kind of organize them. Um, if you've been teaching courses for many years, these can sort of pile up on you. Um, they used to delete them, uh, but we found that um, we have plenty of space, and so um, there's not a real advantage to deleting them at this point. You never know when you might be asked to or teach a course that you haven't taught in a while, and you can go back and, and find the old one and, and maybe do a course copy. But again, then there's a long list of them. So by hiding the old courses, this will keep you a little bit more organized. Uh, the second oddball tip is that when you are creating a link in the text editor, um, set it to open in a new window. Um, we can also get kind of used to um, the way our Outlook, if we put anything that remotely looks like a URL, you know, it will automatically create this hyperlink. That doesn't happen in Blackboard. So if we are going to create a link, we're going to highlight that text and we're going to use the chain button up in the text editor to create a link, add that URL in. But again, then we're going to select from the drop down that it open up in a new window. And that's so students can um, maybe review something, but then they can easily go back into, into the course um, through two different tabs. So we suggest um, selecting that open in a new window. Another oddball tip, didn't know where to put it, is to look for this collapse button, which again, if you kind of hover over the left hand side in between the, the main part of the um, blackboard and the left hand navigation, you'll see this little gray arrow come up. And what that will do is that will collapse that left hand navigation, um, kind of remove it from the picture and give you some more um, area to kind of work in the grade center. Also, if you're using inline grading, it kind of just spreads out everything and then you're not using that bottom bar as much to kind of move across your area. Okay, so we are actually in the last couple of minutes, but I want you to be able to share any tips that you have or if you have any questions. Um, just add them, but I would, I would love to hear any any tips that you've discovered. And keep adding them if you'd like. But I would like to close things off and make sure I stop the recording so everyone can view it later. Um, again, my name is Tracy Miller and I'm the online teaching coordinator. Here is some contact information if you'd like to email me or if you'd like to follow me on Twitter. Um, I will be sending a survey out to everyone and a copy of this recording. 
Um, so again, you can look at it at a later time, which is actually a good recommendation for um, a, a session. If you are doing that and you record it, you can give it to your students to review later. So that's kind of a, a tip I just thought of myself. Great. I'm going to add the um, the survey link into the text chat area. So if you're thinking about it right now, go ahead and take it and cross that off your list. Um, I love having um, feedback and improving my workshops. Thank you, everybody. You are welcome. Um, I really enjoyed sharing some of these things with you this afternoon. Yeah.